Good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's town council meeting here in council chambers on November 10th, 2014 at 7 p.m. And we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Councilor Crosco? Present. Councilor Clements? Present. Councilor Estrada? Present. Councilor Mana? Present. Councilor Moriarty? Present. Councilor Pelequin? Excused. Councilor Steves? Excused. Councilor Vandal? Present. Councilor Vecchio? Present. Seven present. Moving on to agenda item number three. Consider accept the town council meeting minutes of Monday, October 20th, 2014. So moved. Second. Any questions, comments, discussions, clarification? <coughs> Seeing none, a simple hand vote is fine. All those in favor? Unanimous. Agenda item number four, four A. Consider and accept town council the whole meeting minutes on of September 18th, 2014. So moved. Second. Any clarifications, questions, or comments? Are we abstaining? Thank you. Seeing no others, a simple hand vote is fine. All those in favor? With one abstention. Agenda item 4B, consider and accept town council the whole meeting minutes of October 9th, 2014. So moved. Second. Questions, comments, concerns? Abstaining. Abstaining. Okay, we have two abstentions. Any further? No? A simple hand vote. Those in favor? Thank you. <coughs> Moving on to agenda item number five, subcommittee reports, general government, Councilor Clements. Thank you. We have uh, two sets of meeting minutes here. Uh, one from October 22nd, 2014, general government subcommittee was held in the George Parent Conference Room in attendance for myself, committee members, Council Vandal, Councilor Pelequin, citizens members, Michael Janes and Holly Christo. Also in attendance were town manager Pecos and Mindy Ernest Funier. We called the meeting to order at 6.30 p.m. First agenda item was to vote to approve the health insurance renewals for two Blue Cross and Blue Shield and Fallon senior plans effective January 1, 2015 through December 31, 2015 and submit to council for ratification. Holly Christo disclosed that her mom receives benefits through one of these plans and did not know whether she uh, needed to recuse herself from voting. I explained that there was no need for her to recuse herself as the plan amounts have been set and they do not vote on the, uh, we don't vote on the amounts of the premiums and also it's a general, um, it's, a, it's a general insurance that covers everybody, so it's not in one's own personal interest in, in that respect. Uh, Ms. Ernest <laughs> Funier explained the changes in the plan. Uh, we presently have 24 members on Fallon and 205 members on Medics, two members on Medicare. The monthly increase is paid by both the member and the town. A motion was made by Councilor Vandal, seconded by Councilor Pelican, with a favorable recommendation to Council to approve the health insurance renewals for two Blue Cross and Blue Shield and Fallon Senior Plans effective January 1st, 2015 through December 31st, 2015. Um, it was unanimous. All in favor, 5-0. Agenda item number two is vote to approve the changes to Schedule 5 to reflect the changes to minimum wage from $8 per hour to $9 per hour effective January 1st, 2015 according to MGL Chapter 144 of the Acts of 2014 and submit to Council for ratification. Ms. Enius, uh, Ms. Ernst Fournier explained the changes of those positions. The changes will take effect on January 1st, 2015. The two departments affected can cover the difference within their current department budgets. The increase is $144 for election workers and $928.80 for the library. That's overall. A motion was made by Holly Christo and seconded by Councilor Pelican with a favorable recommendation to Council <coughs> to approve the change in Schedule 5 to reflect the changes of minimum wage from $8 an hour to $9 an hour effective January 1st, 2015, according to MGL Chapter 144, Acts of 2014. It was unanimous all in favor 5-0 to recommend to council. Again, that was a, uh, there's an hourly minimum wage change that the government's put forth, so we were uh, correcting that accordingly. Motion to adjourn was made by Holly Christo, seconded by Mike Janes, and we adjourn the meeting at 6.45. I respectfully submitted Evelyn Rivera, recording clerk. Next set of minutes was from the Monday, November 3rd meeting. 
Uh, we held the meeting on the 3rd in the George Parent Conference Room. In attendance were myself, committee members Councilor Vandal, Councilor Pelequin, and Citizens Member Mike Janes. Also in attendance were Councilor Steves, Councilor Mana, Town Manager Pecos, Richard Holland, and Holly Christo was excused. Let me change that. I call the meeting to order at 6.33. The first agenda item was vote to recommend the changes to Schedule 5 to reflect the added position of temporary loader operator snow removal at the Southbridge Municipal Airport at an hourly rate of 25.10 per hour and to submit to Council for ratification. This is the same pay rate as a DPW heavy equipment operator. I mentioned that the airport had its own budget and there were no uh, there was no position listed for snow remo removal in the current Schedule 5. This position is an, is an as-needed position and the person would be using our equipment. Mr. Pecos said there are many volunteers at the airport and they help with much of the snow removal. This position would be part of the airport's snow removal budget. A motion was made by Mike Janes and seconded by Councilor Vandal okay. with a favorable recommendation to Council to approve the changes to Schedule 5 to reflect the added position of the temporary loader operator snow removal at the Southbridge Municipal Airport at an hourly rate of 2510. Vote by show of hands. All in favor, 4-0. Second agenda item was vote to recommend the Town of Southbridge enter into a partnership with Borrego Solar Systems for uh, PV solar purchase, which is uh, photovoltaic solar purchase, and net metering credits to authorize the town manager to complete and sign the agreement and to submit to council for ratification. Mr. Pecos introduced Richard Holland from Copeland and Page. Mr. Pecos said he applied and received a grant which pays for technical advice needed when considering purchase of PV solar and net metering credits. Mr. Pecos explained the different ways PV solar works, and there are three different options. One, the town owns the land and the equipment. Two, the town would lease land and purchase power from the owner of the land. And three, the town buys power from a third party who has the PV solar on private property for a set price and receives net meter credits, which we can sell to others. With the third option, the town has no upfront costs and there is very little risk to the town. Mr. Holland said he has negotiated deals like this since 2008 for many municipalities. He said these are fairly common agreements. Mr. <coughs> Holland said the net meter credits have been, been increased through the years and at one part they were 0.06 and 0.07 per credit and we are now between 0.11 and 0.12 per credit. Mr. James raised concerns that would be on the hook for electricity costs higher than we can sell it for in the future. Mr. Pecos said we cannot predict the future but there are many other municipalities that are doing this now. Um, our recording clerk had excused herself at 745 and then Councillor Steves continued with the meeting minutes. So, Mr. Paco said he expects electricity costs to rise in a large part due to our reliance on fossil fuels with value of these net metering credits covered pretty much by the rest of the ratepayers over the long term. In Massachusetts, the goal is to have 5% of electricity from alternative sources by 2020. It's currently about 3%. Mike Chain said he's concerned we might end up buying power for a higher cost than our net metering credits are worth. While that could happen, if there's a major, major discovery that makes power production very cheap, Mr. Pecos said he expects our cost in 20 years to be twice of what it is now, a figure that will st still probably low, be lower than the net meter credit value. Southbridge uses 7 to 9 megawatts a year, and this project could cover about 75% of that, about 5.83 megawatts. If we end up using less than our contracted amount, we can resell the unused energy to other municipalities and we can aggregate power purchasing on behalf of residents and local businesses, although that would take some time um, and work to set up. Mike James asked why Borrego is offering this to Southbridge. Mr. Pecos noted that standard that it's standard that such um, energy is commonly offered to the host community first. In our case, we'd be getting net metering credits from the Borrego facility um, on a site that's here in Southbridge that they're working on, Spring Hill and South Berry. The last two are nearly complete while the Gulfwood site is still being uh, before the planning board. He added Bob Peterson will analyze, that's another um, one of the uh, consultants, will analyze what we consume, wh um, whether doing this would make sense and whether we could buy more net metering credits and resell them, which could be risky but bring in good money. The net metering credit purchase prices have no direct relationship to what we actually pay for power, now 7.7 .7 cents per kilowatt, for municipal buildings, 8 cents for the high school. He recommended taking about a quarter of the net metering credit value from elsewhere in the budget, putting it aside in a capital reserve account just in case prices um, do rise more than expected. If they don't, we can use it for other needs, like our OPEV um, obligation, health insurance sharing, um, sharing, and our road work and such every three to five years. I asked about safeguards. Mr. Hall, Rick, uh, Rich, 
Rick Holland of Copen and Page said the risk is, quote, is owned by the purchaser of the credits, end quote, meaning the town. These deals are fixed price deals, but he negotiated a mitigation provision. If the net meter credit value falls, so we're losing more than $5,000, it would force Borrego to renegotiate rates. Investors won't find such projects if towns can just walk away. So if net meter and credits values fall, we'll lose money. But if the energy price rises faster than the escalator, which is 2% per year, we'll keep making money. It's a bit complicated. There was a lot of discussion that night. The concept has existed since 2008, and he said he's not aware of any community losing money so far. The manager said Borrego intends to start building early next year, and the contract has a, quote, commercial operating deadline of December 2015, excluding certain kinds of force majeure incidents. If we accept it, we'd be committed for 20 years, but if Borrego doesn't meet that deadline, we can opt out with a 30-day notice period. He has arranged for Borrego, a representative from Borrego, and Mr. Peterson to be at the council meeting on 11-17 to provide more details. Mike James moved and Councilor uh, Pelequin seconded to postpone consideration of this item to the next general government meeting, and that was unanimous by those present. So we, speaking of that, we will have that meeting this Wednesday um, here at the town hall at 6 o'clock, I believe. Um, I was then asked... To add an agenda. Oh, okay. So that was the end of that particular discussion, all on that net metering credits, and we moved forward. I did ask to add an agenda item, which was the acceptance of a $5,000 gift for holiday lights at the Common, citing, quote, the timeliness factor with the holiday season approaching, end quote, as my rationale. Mike James so moved, and Councillor Vandal seconded. All were in favor to add the agenda item. Um, and I commented that the, uh, the, common, uh, the Commons lights are mostly broken, except for uh, one new tree's worth donated last year. A lot of the common lights, we all know that. The lights aren't so great, and we're, we have a very generous uh, donation um, coming forth here to help to replace some of those lights. It certainly won't replace all of them, but it will do an, a wonderful job if we can get them on the trees. According to the letter from attorney Nancy Kadir, the donor wishes to remain anonymous, but wants the donation to be in memory of Rudy DiGregorio. Mike James moved to accept the $5,000 gift from an anonymous donor for purchase of holiday lights. Councillor Pelequin seconded. All were in favor. And we adjourned that meeting at 8.20 that evening. So if you want to learn more about the, um, the net metering credits and, and the proposal that's on the table for solar, I suggest you come to our meeting on Wednesday. That's it. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on to B, DPW, Councillor Vandal. Um, no report, no meeting schedule. Thank you. Thank you. C, Education and Human Services, is Councillor Pelliquid, who is not here. <clears throat> a meeting of the EHS subcommittee was held on Wednesday, October 29, uh, 2014, in the Rice Conference Room. In attendance were Chairwoman Pelliquid, Councillor Steves, Councillor Vecchia, citizen members Martina Shea and Kristen Eau Claire. Also in attendance were Councillor Estrada, Town Manager Pecos, Mike Trombley, and Andrew Pelletier. <laughs> Councillor Pelliquid called the meeting to order at 7 p.m. Agenda item number one, vote to recommend the formation of the Regional Veterans District subject to the requirements of Mass General Law Chapter 115 and submit to Council for ratification. <clears throat> Town Manager Pecos said he was approached by the Charlton Administrator <coughs> regarding partnering for a Regional Veterans Agent. The law states that for towns with over 12,000 people in population, uh, they must have a full-time Veterans Service Officer, or VSO, or be covered by a District Veterans Officer. In order to create a district, it must be approved by the Commissioner of Veteran Affairs, or rather Veteran Services, for the state of Massachusetts. Auburn and Oxford might also like to partner. From the beginning of the year until July 1, 2015, Charlton and Southbridge would partner with other communities possibly joining after July 1, 2015. The other communities would have to advise us if they would like to join by March of 2015. Because Mike Trombley would have to be in Charlton a certain amount of time, Mr. Pecos would like to hire a part-time assistant to help Mike with his Council on Aging duties. This position would be, would be a combined recreational director and assistant COA director. Charlton would contribute $16,000 for this fiscal year, <clears throat> and these funds combined with the recre recreational department budget would allow us to hire a single part-time recreation director, assistant COA director. Discussion was held on the benefits under Chapter 115 and who was eligible. Motion was made by Councillor Steves and seconded by Martina Shea with a favorable recommendation to Council to recommend the formation of the Regional Veterans District subject to the requirements of Mass General Law Chapter 115. Vote by a show of hands. All in favor, five to nothing. <coughs> Agenda item number two, discuss pediatric asthma rates in Southbridge. 
Councilor Pelequin shared statistics from the head of the Southbridge School Nurse. 27.5% of, of uh, school children have asthma in our community. <clears throat> the Community Health Network of Southern Worcester County is having a meeting on Friday, October 31st at Harrington Hospital to gain a better understanding of the complex issue of asthma and respiratory health. Councilor Steves and Health Director and Andy Pelletier will attend this meeting. Discussion was held on the dynamics that trigger asthma symptoms. Mr. Pelletier explained that the number one trigger seems to be low income housing environment. The three highest concerns for Southbridge are asthma, prescription drugs, and domestic violence. That appears, unless somebody has a different version, to be the end of the minutes. It does not include what time the meeting was adjourned or if there was anything beyond that. So I apologize for that. Uh, if there is, we will correct that for you going forward. I know of no meetings currently scheduled for EHS. So we'll move on to D, Planning and Development. Councilor Manna. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, I did not have any meetings. I have no meeting minutes, but I do have a meeting scheduled for November 20th at 6 p.m. in the George Parent Conference Room. Thank you. Thank you. E, Protection of Persons and Properties. Councilor Carrasco. We have had no meetings. Um, we do have a meeting scheduled at 1119 at 6 p.m. Um, and that um, our primary agenda item is to discuss um, the reverse 911 um, policy, um, how we are going to use um, our current system that we have in place. And also, we are still in the need of individuals that are interested in being part of the fire committee study, um, where this group of individuals will look at all the different options in regards to our current fire station and also future uh, possibilities. Um, so if you are interested, please um, contact uh, Chief DeFranzo or see or contact our town manager's office and um, speak to Yvonne in regards to being part of that um, committee because that is also another item that we will be discussing that night. So again, um, 11.19 at 6 p.m. Moving on to F, Town Manager Search Committee, Councilor Carrasco. Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, once again, um, we've had some bit of interesting um, news. Um, we have yet to come down to um, some finalists. Um, we had a group of 70 finalists, and unfortunately, um, we had another individual drop out um, from our um, Town Manager Search um, process. So we and uh, Town Manager Search Committee will meet again um, either end of this week or early next week to discuss the possibilities of how we want to move forward with um, the current search. That's all I have for today. Okay, thank you. Moving on to agenda item number six, Chairman's announcements. I have just a few. Uh, one, the McCann Fields and Park Improvements Committee uh, will hold a public outreach meeting to discuss the community's vision for the redesign of that field complex. The meeting will be held on Wednesday, this upcoming Wednesday at 7 p.m. at the Community Center, 153 Chestnut Street. Uh, for more information, you can contact Sandy Ackley here at Town Hall. And more or less, uh, the, the Quick Reader's Digest version of this is uh, a little while ago, this committee was formed uh, by the town. There is grant money that is being used uh, to pay for an engineer, uh, and there will be grant money used uh, to actually reconstruct the fields down on Henry Street. Uh, currently, there are two Little League fields, a, an adult softball field, uh, and some basketball courts and a small playground. And the intent for this committee is to more or less, in this case especially, reach out to the general public, find out what sort of use they would like to see down there, would they like to see some sort of different type of field complex, the same thing, how it would be designed, and so forth. Uh, so this is a chance to kind of help with that. And again, that'll be this upcoming Wednesday at 7 p.m. at uh, the Community Center, the former Armory. Uh, earlier tonight, I was, I was joined by a few, of the, uh, few other councillors uh, and, and uh, a school committee member uh, to kind of announce uh, for the press the, what we're calling the Big Old Turkey Bowl, uh, which will be held on Saturday, November 22nd at 6.30 p.m. over at McMahon Field. And basically what this is is a seven-on-seven -seven, uh, flag football game between ourselves in terms of the uh, Southbridge Council, school committee, and so forth against the Webster Selectman School Committee and so forth. Uh, there will be no admission for this event uh, outside of the insurance bills that we'll each collect. Uh, but folks are encouraged to attend. Uh, they can bring non-perishable items which will be used for food share, which helps out both in Salvage and Webster. 
uh, and or some new toys for the Marine Corps League's Toy for Tots program, which also helps out uh, some needy families here in Southbridge as well as Webster. The game will itself will be preceded by a punt, pass, and kick competition for kids ages 12 and under at 5.30 p.m. As of the moment, and this, this could change, uh, hopefully for the better, in terms of adding rather than subtracting, uh, the Southbridge team at the moment includes myself, uh, interim manager Kevin Pecos, uh, Vice Chairman Esteban Carrasco, and Councilors Estrada, Peliquin, and Steves, as well as school committee members uh, Jill Condon, Chris Olivo, and Aaron Quinney. On the Webster side of things, the losing side of things, we have, uh, currently anyways, the Town Administrator, John McAuliffe, Selectman Will, uh, Will Starzak, uh, Selectman Andrew Jolda, Town Engineer Planner Scott Charpentier, and Executive Secretaries Courtney Friedland and Melissa Weatherby. And we look forward for that opportunity on Saturday, November 22nd, and that is, of course, in advance of the 93rd annual Southbridge Bartlett uh, Thanksgiving Day game. Uh, for my last one or two items, uh, with tomorrow being Veterans Day, uh, if we could, I would like to actually to have our Veteran Service Director, Mike Trombley, to, to meet me over here at the podium for a minute. So one of the things that, uh, that we've done over the last couple of years, uh, we've, I've talked a lot about anyways those, these last two years, has been uh, doing more on Veterans Day or for Veterans Day uh, as a community. Uh, and as such, I, I've spoken to Mike a number of times about this, trying to come up with ideas. And, and one of the things that we've talked about, among with a few others, uh, is what is more or less being called uh, uh, Operation Honor Salbridge's Veterans. And the plan is, uh, in talking to, to Mr. Trombley, as well as to uh, some of the representatives from the Veterans Council in town, uh, there are funds that have already been raised by that agency, and we'll be reaching out to other uh, businesses and individuals uh, to help with this. But the plan is to uh, raise enough money in order to take uh, a, at least one luxury bus load worth of, of local veterans and uh, take them down to Washington, D.C. Uh, at some point in April, uh, for a few days in order, in order for them to take a look at, uh, at the monuments that are built for themselves and, and their peers and comrades uh, in combat. Um, so I want to thank Mr. Trombley for, for his efforts in helping with that. Uh, there will be more information on that coming forward, but we, want, we felt it was important to kind of make sure people knew about that with tomorrow being Veterans Day. And beyond that, uh, with tomorrow being Veterans Day, uh, one other thing that, that uh, we like to do is, is uh, find the good and praise it. And, and in this case, uh, we have, grab the right ones. <clears throat> we have a few proclamations, the first of which is for Mr. Trombley here. Surprise. <laughs> With great honor and recognition for your loyal and dedicated service to the United States of America as a military veteran uh, and to the citizens of Southbridge, we thank you. And this was signed by myself and the vice chairman. Thank you very much. We also have uh, that same proclamation that we'd like to offer to Mr. Kevin Pecos, also a military veteran. And as he makes his way down, <clears throat> and we also have uh, one for Councillor Conrad Vandal, also a, a veteran, uh, and Councillor Carrasco has that for him here. Thank you. We'd like to thank all of the veterans, both here but elsewhere uh, in the town and in the community, for your service. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on to agenda item number seven, town manager's announcements to our resident veteran manager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a couple things. First, uh, an update on downtown sidewalk um, <clears throat> from um, Sandy Ackley, ED director. Uh, we have a great contractor and work has gone well, but it has been quite disruptive to shopkeepers and services, as well as to their customers and clients. This is the last week of prep work 
Almost all of the curbing has been installed, followed by adding a gravel base, compacting, and grading. Towards the end of the week, they will be cleaning up and getting ready to pour concrete. Weather permitting, concrete pouring will begin next week, starting at Goddard Street and moving eastward. Uh, weather permitting will be about a week, uh, less than a week. <clears throat> Even though the south side of Main Street is under construction, we invite everyone to visit the businesses and services. The police are there to guide you, and you will find that you can easily walk along the sidewalk gravel base. Zoe's, Clockwork Gallery and Tattoo, Dr. Rubin, Planners Envy, Southbridge Eye Associates, and Village Photo are all keeping their regular hours and are ready, willing, and able to welcome you. This process has been very difficult for them, and they greatly appreciate your business. Other businesses and services have rear entrances, including the banks, so you will not be inconvenienced at all when you do your banking. Again, we thank you for your patience as we all eagerly anticipate the end of this project. Second announcement, <clears throat> um, also from Sandy Ackley and Economic Development Planning, Master Plan Implementation. Um, they are making a last call for volunteers to sit on the Master Plan Implementation Committee, which will be a new committee to review the Master Plan and Implementation steps and make recommendations to the various persons, departments, boards, and commissions that will actually undertake each of the many strategies and steps. We have volunteers, but can still use more. If you are interested, please fill out a board information form, which you can obtain on the town website, or call Sandy Ackley at 764-5402 so that she can get one to you. The Planning and Development Subcommittee will be discussing the formation of the Implementation Committee on November 20th. <clears throat> and the last announcement I have, Mr. Chairman, members of the Council, um, as you recall, recently there were some newspaper stories associated with uh, the um, appointments of um, one of our Lieutenant Police Officers to the rank of Deputy Chief and another of our Sergeant Officers to the rank of Lieutenant. Um, there was some um, unfortunate representations made through, that, uh, through those newspaper stories, and I have been working very quietly um, with the members of the police union, with the members of the police department leadership. Um, the chairman has been involved in some of those conversations, and what we have been uh, attempting to do um, is to discern the complete truth of everything that occurred, and most importantly of all, to preserve the good reputations of the very, very fine offices that we have. Um, so in consultation um, with all of those people, um, I prepared this statement that I'd like to read now, Mr. Chairman, with your permission. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> to town council and through the council to the public, from myself, subject police officer investigation. On or about October 2nd, 2014, I was told by Councilor Chair Moriarty that he had received a call from a Channel 25 reporter inquiring into the provisional appointment of then Lieutenant Shan Woodson as provisional deputy chief. Councilor Moriarty played the voicemail on his phone for me. The person speaking identified himself as a reporter for Channel 25 and went on to say that he was asking for commentary on the appointment of Lieutenant Woodson and further was the town aware of certain criminal allegations that occurred some years ago against Lieutenant Woodson. I advised the chairman that I would investigate and report back. <clears throat> Subsequent to this meeting, I received a similar call and a voicemail message with a similar concern from the same reporter. At this time, the people who knew that the appointment was pending <clears throat> was an extremely small group, all entitled to receive and protect confidential personal information, personnel information. In addition, I was told that there had been discussion and speculation at the police department of the pending appointments. For that reason, I determined that the call to the media would likely have been made by a member of the Southbridge PD. I began an inquiry into the allegations, as well as the identity of the person who called Channel 25. During this entire investigation, it was my considered opinion that the identity of the caller was critical to discover as the person's intent was clearly to spread false and vicious rumors about a trusted senior police officer and by so doing to block his promotion. If it were the case that the person who called the media was an officer in the Southbridge PD, 
then such an act would be a disciplinary offense and, if proven, would subject the officer to discipline up to and including dismissal. Thus, I considered it imperative to identify the party who made the call, if possible. I learned that the allegation in question against Lieutenant Woodson were baseless and very, me ne very nearly meaningless in light of his 20-year record as an exceptional police officer in Southbridge. I also received information from an extremely well-connected and trustworthy source that the phone call to Channel 25 was made by Sergeant Dingy or Sergeant Carlos Dingy or someone acting in his behalf, unquote. I shared these findings with the council chair and vice chair, as well as Chief Charette, Lieutenant Woodson, and eventually Sergeant Jose Dingy. The response I received from these individuals suggested that perhaps the information I had received initially needed further probing, as nearly all expressed their doubt that Sergeant Carlos Dingy was the source of the phone call. Over the course of the next two weeks, I continued to probe these events and spoke to many people, some in the law enforcement community and some in the media, as well as others who might shed some purposeful light on the subject. On or about Sunday, October 19th, I received a return call indicating that the information that had been supplied earlier was only partially accurate. Specifically, that Sergeant Carlos Dingy had definitively not made the call to the media and that the call was made by others in the community apparently intent on harming both Lieutenant Woodson as well as Sergeant Dingy. Both of these officers have suffered embarrassment and damage to their good reputations as a result of certain persons' evil intent. While I cannot identify the guilty party at this time, I can say with absolute conviction that Sergeant Carlos Dingy made no call to the media and is thus not guilty of any attempt to harm the candidacy of Lieutenant Woodson. In point of fact, I have learned that both officers are longtime friends and enjoy great respect for one another. <clears throat> this unfortunate incident is the result of vicious, destructive behavior by persons in Southbridge whose continuous intent is to harm innocent people to achieve their perceived political goals. This kind of outrageous behavior has harmed the town in the past, it has tarnished our image, and it must be rejected by all good and decent citizens of Southbridge. Only by exposing and condemning this behavior does the community have an opportunity to move into more positive activities and earn a reputation for Southbridge, which marks us as a community with mature politics and a respect for all persons, regardless of political differences. And may I add, that is who I believe this community is, most assuredly. I appreciate the Council's indulgence in listening to this and for helping me to do our very best to ensure that the reputations of our employees are safeguarded. Simply put, Deputy Chief Woodson and Sergeant Carlos Dingy are excellent police officers and two very, very good men. I am proud to work with both. Thank you. And that will be distributed, Mr. Chairman and members of the Council, uh, to the press um, as widely as I am able. Um, Council Amanda very kindly um, offered to forward it to the Worcester Telegram for me. He's here tonight. Since I don't always oh, hear. Oh, even yes. better. Oh, good. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, so I will get you a copy of that and be happy to chat with you at length uh, today, tomorrow, whenever you'd like. Um, and Mr. Chairman, members of the Council, I just can't emphasize enough that this is the sort of thing that we've got to put behind us. Um, and I know the Council is, is working very, very hard to set a good, positive tone for the community. So many very good things happening. Um, and we've got to embellish those things and emphasize them and, you know, really set a good tone. So thank you for letting me read that. I thought it was very important to uh, be sure that that's out on the record for employees that I feel very strongly about and very good about. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on to agenda item number eight, swearing in and presentation. Uh, the first of which is from the Aero Venture Institute Flight School. And we will have Mr. George Allen as well as, I'm sure, uh, Mr. Puff or whomever. <laughs>
Members of the Council, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, my pleasure to be here uh, once again. I was here back in May uh, when we first started up our, our operation at the Southbridge Municipal Airport. And I'm back again because I'd like to, in the next five minutes or so, give you a just kind of a 30,000 foot overview of what we've accomplished in just those few short months uh, since, we've, since we've moved into the airport. Uh, I'm going to start first with a video. There is no sound, uh, so I'll kind of talk through it. But I want to give you sort of a visual impression um, of what we've done over the summer. And I also have a couple of pictures to follow that up while I finish some of my points. So let me just cue this up real quick. Thank you. Let's see if I can make that full screen. So what I'd like you to see through this video is really how um, we, we've taken this airport and really brought it to life over the summer. Uh, I know some of you have stopped up. Uh, we held a, a lot of events uh, from May all the way through uh, just this last month, actually. And uh, some of these shots are from our free fly day. That was one of the first things that we did, actually, uh, right after we moved in. It was mid-June. Uh, it was a beautiful day. And we flew over, uh, I believe the last count was 125 people um, between 11 o'clock and 3.30 or 4 o'clock. I think it went a little over time. Uh, those are members of the community and, and the local region that experienced aviation, flight, seeing their town, uh, maybe even their home for the first time from the air. I mean, that's, that's an exciting thing. Uh, and again, the point of departure was right in your backyard here. Uh, a lot of these uh, videos here representing some middle and high school students that we had throughout the summer. Uh, we worked with a lot of organizations like Girls Inc, uh, who was out in June, July, and August. We had them out three months in a row. Uh, we had Mass Academy Young Engineers. Mass Academy is a school, uh, the specialty high school that's attached to uh, WPI. They run a middle school summer camp every year. Um, we also partnered up with uh, Cops and Kids. We had them out for an airport tour, which went brilliantly. Uh, the kids really enjoyed sitting in the aircraft, getting pictures next to them, and, uh, and just learning more about what these really cool machines are and how they work. Uh, nice aerial shot of your airport there. So that's, that's the video. And I'm just going to switch over to slides real quick while I finish up some of the other activities we did. There we go. Um, so the other thing we had uh, in August was the Aerospace Discovery Weekend. That's an event we hold every year. It was four, uh, four days long this year. And it's where uh, anywhere between 20 and 25 students uh, per session come out and, again, experience everything about flight and aerospace, the industry, what's out there for them, and really plants a seed in their mind uh, of things that they may not have even thought about before. Um, it went, it went very well. We also uh, went down to the community center on, uh, I think it was the second day in. Our community partners, uh, David Clark Company in Worcester, um, they're the ones that make the pressurized spacesuits, and they also make the uh, little green headsets you always see pilots wearing in the aircraft. Um, let me see if I can get to it there. This is our Aerospace Discovery Weekend students mixed with the Cops and Kids uh, uh, summer camp that Jose Dingy runs. And, uh, in the far corner there in the back, I know it's hard to see, I'll get to the next slide in a second, uh, is two of the engineers explaining uh, the Red Bull Stratosuit that Felix Baumgarten used in his record-breaking jump, which actually I think his record was just beaten too. Um, there's some, uh, some students that attended in their oversized uh, spacesuits, but we told them, don't worry, you'll grow into it eventually. So, um, But David Clark Company, uh, they're great partners of ours, and we're really happy to bring them down to Southbridge and let the kids uh, experience and talk to the engineers and try the suits on and even try some space food and just see what all this stuff is about. Um, so that was our summer. Uh, our summer saw over 350 middle and high school students uh, at Southbridge Municipal Airport, which is a significant achievement. And uh, this is another shot here. Uh, you can't quite see him. He's just past the cabin. But uh, John Silverberg, is uh, he, he actually learned to fly at the airport when he was in his teens. And uh, now he's an airline pilot. But he owns this neat little glider here. Uh, you'll see him flying it most, most days during the summer and spring. And uh, here he's talking to students about uh, what it's like to soar in the sky with really no engine. It's, uh, it's kind of fascinating. And um, let's see, what else did we do this year? 
It's a picture from Free Fly Day. We had nothing but smiling faces and happy families the whole time. It's really a great experience. Um, in September, we were notified again by uh, the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. They are the largest uh, aviation community in the world. And uh, every year for the past uh, five or six years now, they've been ranking flight schools throughout the nation. We were very, uh, very surprised and humbled to find out for the second year in a row that we've been named as one of the top 10 flight schools in the country. To put that in perspective, that's out of 1,447 flight schools across the country. And we're in the top 10 uh, for the second year in a row. So this is, this is something that we're really happy um, to, to bring to this community. And, and you know, the, the big thing for me uh, and what I want for this community is everyone to look at that airport and be proud of it, to say, that's happening right here in our backyard. All this cool activity, all these <laughs> students learning about aviation and aerospace and this getting on a track of, of career preparedness, or if not even that, just exploration and education and STEM. Uh, it's all about the science, the technology, the engineering and mathematics in a very fun, uh, exciting environment of aviation. Um, so on top of that, we rolled out this past summer what's called the Professional Aviator Cadet Program. Um, so if you ever stop up at the airport, uh, most likely you'll find them on Sunday mornings and occasionally throughout the week. Uh, you'll see teenage kids wearing uniforms like this with a stripe on their shoulder and uh, they kind of look like airline pilots in training. That's all for a reason. Uh, the Professional Aviator Cadet Program starts you out with uh, initial pilot training and the cool thing about this program is that for the cost of a pilot's license anywhere else that you would go, you call another flight school, they'll quote you a price. For that same price, we can take a student from zero all the way up to a private pilot's license which is point one. Point two is that they can get six college credits through this program while they're still in high school. That's significant. That's a huge thing for a, for a, a high school student to put on their resume. The other great thing is, uh, this takes a little more coordination with uh, high schools, and I'm actually working with Ron Pluff, the airport manager, to reach out to Southbridge and other surrounding communities uh, to get this started. Uh, this program is certified uh, so that high schools can take it in as science elective credit on the high school transcript. Uh, so it does need uh, national teaching standards uh, for STEM education. So it's another huge bonus to this program. Um, and again, the, pi the pilot's license, a student at age 16 can solo an airplane once they have sufficient training, and they do that by phase two of the program. By phase four of the program, they should have their private pilot's license in their hand, and they're only 17 years old. So this stuff is happening at Southbridge Municipal Airport. We've already had six kids through the program. It's sort of in a beta test stage right now with a full rollout planned for the fall. So right now we're kind of working with uh, folks in the surrounding community to get the word out and to plant the seeds and to work with the school districts to make them aware of these programs. Um, the other thing uh, that was very, very recent, we just sent out an email about two weeks ago, is the Aerospace Education Grant for K through 12 teachers. Uh, this is open to K through 12 teachers all throughout the state of Massachusetts. It's a $500 grant that is being offered by Aero Venture Institute for anyone that can give us a really stunning proposal about how they're going to use that money to integrate um, aerospace and aviation into their STEM curriculum in the classroom and really help kids uh, become aware of this really exciting field. And uh, my last point, I know my time is probably running out, uh, on Sunday, December 14th, between 11 and 3, uh, we don't have this on the website yet, but we're going to be flying Santa in from the North Pole. So I know he's got a really busy schedule, but he decided to take some time out and come visit the, uh, the, the kids at Southbridge. So uh, we'll be flying him in. Uh, s snow or shine, I guess. I don't really want to say the snow word yet. And uh, I should also note to that, I think they're actually right after me, uh, Toys for Tots. We are not a uh, official drop site, but we will be collecting uh, donations for Toys for Tots uh, up at the airport on the Santa fly-in day. Uh, so keep your eye on our website. Um, it'll be aeroventureinstitute.org forward slash Santa. We're keeping it really simple. Uh, you just keep checking until it's up live. It'll probably be up in a week or so. Um, and that's pretty much all I have, so I appreciate your time, and I'll take any questions if, if you have any. Councilor Manna? Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. First, congratulations on um, the, the
the recognition being top 10 in the country. Thank you. Second, I know you said check the website for the Santa Flying Day, but now that you mentioned it, do you have a time? Uh, between 11 and 3, I think, is what we're, what we're planning right now. We, we may extend that by an hour or two. Will you be flying in his elves also? I'm sorry? <laughs> will you be flying in his elves also? Yes, actually, we will. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else with questions, comments? Councilor Vecchia? Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, Mr. Allen, I just want you to know that uh, it's very commendable and you should be very proud of yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you for your time and uh, thank you again. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Speaking of Santa Claus and his elves, we have here on the actual birthday of the Marine Corps uh, being founded, we have uh, a Marine, Jim Sotilli, who will be on hand to tell us a little bit about Toys for Tots. My name is James Sotilli. I'm the Commandant of the South Central Massachusetts Marine Corps League, Detachment 1094. I'm with you tonight to make a few, two announcements concerning uh, the Marine Corps and Toys for Tots. On this day in 1775, the United States Marine Corps was founded by the Continental Congress. Two battalions of Marines were stood up and to serve uh, with the fleets in the United States. The sheer tenacity and grit of those first Marines helped them fight one of the world's greatest powers and establish <clears throat> our freedom, nation's freedom. And in the 239 years since, Marines have by advantage come from the sea and carried on that same tradition of honor, courage, fighting tyranny, and defending our liberty from Tripoli to Harpers Ferry to the Argonne to Bella Wood, Peleliu, the Solomons, Iwo Jima, Korea, Vietnam, Beirut, Iraq, and now in Helmand Province in Afghanistan. Happy birthday, Marines. I want to take this opportunity also, also take this opportunity to announce the start of the South Central Massachusetts 2014 U.S. Marine Corps Reserve Toys for Tots campaign. We are the only licensed uh, authorized uh, organization that, will conduct, that can conduct the Toys for Tots program. Uh, Detachment 1094 Marines will be distributing drop-off boxes at several locations in Southbridge starting tomorrow. I want to also take the opportunity to thank uh, Captain Pecos for his help uh, acqu acquiring a space for us in the old high school so we can uh, store and distribute our toys. It's always a pleasure for the Army to help the Marines. Sir. Aye, aye, sir. <laughs> Fair winds and following seas to you. <laughs> the mission of the U.S. Marine Corps Reserve Toys for Tots program is to collect new, unwrapped toys during November and December each year and distribute those toys as Christmas gifts to the less fortunate children in this community in which campaigns are conducted. Detachment 1094 has responsibilities for Webster, Dudley, Charlton, Sturbridge, Southbridge, Spencer, and the Brookfields. The primary goal of the Toys for Tots program is to deliver a new toy at Christmas, a message, a message to less fortunate youngsters that will assist them in becoming responsible, productive, and patriotic systems, citizens. Uh, we, when we distribute a toy, we distribute it to, through uh, local org, uh, organizations, uh, social organizations, and directly to parents. Uh, let the parents distribute the toy to the child and not interfere with that uh, process. The principal Toys for Tots activity which takes place each year is the collection and distribution of toys in the communities in which a Marine Corps Reserve Unit is located. In communities without a reserve unit, the campaign is conducted by the Marine Corps League Detachment, a group of men and women, generally veteran Marines, authorized by the Marine Toys for Tots Foundation to conduct a local Toys for Tots program. Local Toys for Tots campaign coordinators will conduct activities 
which include events designed to increase interest in toys for tots and concurrently generate toys and monetary donations. Marines from my detachment will be delivering drop-off boxes again to several business locations in Southbridge and uh, the Southbridge Municipal Department, such as the Town Hall, Police, and Fire Departments. New and unwrapped toys can be deposited at these locations for later collection and distribution. Detachment Marines will be outside the Sturbridge Walmart on November 28th, 29th, and 30th, and also December 5th, 6th, and 7th, collecting toys and monetary donations. Uh, my coordinators are George Berry and Sebastiano Cipro. Uh, they are uh, running that uh, Toys for Tots campaign for me. Uh, George Berry can be reached at, or any other organization who wants to volunteer and join us in this program, they are welcome just by contacting George Berry at 508-347-9654. And Mr. S uh, Sebastiano, 774-922-4759. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? The, the only one I have. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Satilli, will there be any local um, events? I know usually you have at least one local uh, gathering event or yes, something. Yes, I, I believe on December 5th at the, uh, thank you very much for rem reminding me, uh, at the, uh, um, I forget the name of the restaurant. Vienna? Is it, the, is it in town again? Yes, the yeah. restaurant here in at town the Vienna. in Vienna. Yes. They're holding a, 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 an event. Uh, folks, when they come in, will come. the admission is an, a, an unwrapped toy. And uh, it's, it'll be on December 5th. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and just, uh, again, I know Town Hall is one of the drop-off locations here. Uh, but also, just in general, I think it's a great program. There are a lot of, a lot of kids uh, here and, and elsewhere that, without this sort of thing, uh, would not exactly have a, a very large Christmas, if, if one at all. Uh, so I, I, I thank you for that. And, uh, and again, just as a reminder uh, for that. I've seen, some, I've, seen some tough, I've seen some tough Marines when they're giving out a toy to a kid get very soft. I'm sure they have. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you again. <clears throat> Moving on to a, the third and final presentation, uh, the Conservation Commission. And we have uh, from that panel, we have Ken Pickering and Karen Loyne. Or just Ken. <laughs> Ladies first. Hi, I'm, I'm Ken Pickering, 821 South Street. Uh, members of council, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I've been on the Conservation Commission for the last 20 years or so, and I honestly, I could spend the rest of the evening talking about the trials and tribulations between the laws and the sciences, but we won't do that. I did pass around a brochure, and pretty much my talk is based on that. But I'm, so I'm going to go over a lot of the finer points. That law was passed in 1972, uh, called the Wetlands Protection Act, <clears throat> and it was it was expanded to to include the rivers and the perennial streams in 1996. Maybe you remember when Bill, the governor Bill Well, jumped into the Charles River in '96 in his excitement over getting this law to include rivers uh, passed. I, actually, I think he lost a bet. Anyway, the original law protected the first 100 feet. The buffer zone of wetlands was the first 100 feet uh, of upland from the mean high water mark along the, from along the wetland. This area was referred to as the buffer zone, and it was our job to prevent any work being done in that area unless a measure was taken to prevent harm uh, into this wetland. Such measures could include retaining walls, uh, dikes, berms, and other structures to prevent anything from getting into the wet into the water of the wetlands. Rivers and perennial streams, on the other hand, are given a wider berth. Their buffer zone is actually 200 feet, and that area is referred to as the resource area. So you can see here in Southridge, we've got a lot of buildings and structures in the buffer zone or the, in the resource area. But if you look carefully, they're all protected by having walls or uh, other protection me measures there to protect the waters and the resource area. Southridge has six documented streams, documented perennial streams. And these are the streams that will be there for the, re for the, the, the entire year, uh, as opposed to drying up, such as an intermittent stream. 
And I won't tell you much about those trees other than the fact that you know where Dean Brook is, pretty much on the east side of town. It, it parallels uh, Dresser Hill Road and goes on up the hill towards Sandersdale Road in, in Tarleton. Uh, McKinstry Brook comes down from the airport. It drains a lot of the wetlands up near the airport. It all it comes in from some mostly other wet, other wetlands up in in Charlton. Uh, it flows into the Quinnebaga River Road next to Crane Street. Hatchet Brook. This is our primary water supply. It comes down from Hatchet Pond, and it eventually uh, fills into the res the all three res five, four, and three gets filtered. The residual water coming out of Hatch Brook flows into Westville Dam, so into Westville Recreation Area. Katy Brook follows Route 169 coming from Charlton. Uh, Cohassie Brook comes from pretty much from, from Connecticut. It's a backup. It fills up Cohassie Brook Reservoir. It's the secondary backup unit for our water supply. Lebanon Brook comes through uh, wetlands in Woodstock, Connecticut. This is the brook that in October of 05, we had a 100-year flood. I haven't had one of those in quite a long time. A uh, 100-year flood defines the highest area that water will come. And we have to look at that line of <clears throat> water levels and define a lot of storm water management by that line. Anyway, this is the, the brook that did so much damage to the uh, Brookside Terrace. These uh, six perennial streams are obvious well in resource areas that everybody knows to avoid, hopefully protect. Uh, certainly most of the commercial contractors know this, as do many homeowners. There's testimony to this. Whenever you see a project started near one of these resources, typically we'll get calls from passersby uh, who notice there's no DEP file number. A file number is a sign with a number on it at the site has to be visible from the road. It has to be big enough so that you can see without getting out of your car. In order to get that number, you have to file with us. You file with a DEP through us. Uh, Karen will talk about how that's done in a, in a few minutes. But uh, when they file, they have to bring to us a plan. And this plan is orchestrated or engineered by a civil engineer with wetland experience. And he'll bring to us a file and, and a plan that shows how he will protect the wetland when he's in that resource area. Uh, Karen's also going to discuss the filing and the fees. She's an attorney because it becomes extremely difficult uh, managing the laws that we have to follow. So without Karen's expertise, we get egg on our face without following the right side of the sort of laws. It's, a lot of these laws are very complicated. We want to make sure that there's, there's a certain timeline, there's certain fees, the fees have to be orchestrated and managed. She's very good at doing that. But now what, what's so apparent, what is, isn't apparent are the BVWs, and these are the bordering vegetated wetlands. We know where the streams are, they're pretty obvious. We know where the rivers are, they're very obvious. But what's hard to define are the BVWs. And these are the bogs, the swamps, the floodplains, the marshes. And this is what makes our job so challenging. It's very, very hard to dis dis discern which ones they are and what they are, uh, how, to, how to protect them. Sometimes they're wet and don't qualify. Sometimes they're dry as a bone, but they do qualify. It, it all depends on the analysis of the characteristics of those fields. Uh, they're identified with plant species or soil characteristics, sometimes both. So, uh, soil characteristics of plant communities generally are present throughout the year, and the most reliable indicators of hydrologic conditions. This is just the water environment that these plants uh, live in and the soil conditions. The wetland protection regulations define bordering vegetated wetlands as areas where 50% or more of the vegetated community consists of wetland indicator plants. We could get really technical here, and I'm sure I put you all to sleep. But here we have both obligate species, which are found in wetlands. These are plants that only live in wetlands. And then you have a lot of facultative species. And we could bring down the facultative species as facultative wetland, facultative facultative, and facultative uplands. And then the, the plants that live in these areas are all defined as to how often they're there and what percentage you would find them in a plot. On top of that, you have to count them in a known plot. We'll go out and measure. 
uh, and then count the number of plants, just count the number of specific plants, look at the formula and say, okay, we've got 50% of that, this plant, those are wetland plants, so these are not. Anyway, there's even formulas that you can plug these numbers into to come up with a, a discernible de decision as to whether it is, it's wetland or not. And a soil analysis is often used to confirm the determination of wetlands by plant identification. It's also done by drilling into the soil with an auger, pulling that out, and then looking at the soil, comparing the soil to a color chart. It's called a Munsell color code. And there's about a thousand different color variations, and you look at the soil and compare that. I took the course, MACC, Mass Association of Conservation Commissioners, offers courses uh, throughout the year. Typically, they're all in March at Holy Cross, but they have them year-round elsewhere. When I took the course, I came home dirty, but I also came home with a commitment that this is way too complicated. This is something that I could get the town in trouble trying to do. Let's face it, I work for the town. If I go to a field site, look at, a, just look at the characteristics, define those characteristics according to my <clears throat> determinations, convince the Conservation Commission, hey, this is a wetland because of my findings. We file and refuse to give someone a permit based on my findings. Now, he can challenge that. He can go to the DEP and say, I don't think that's agreeable. I don't agree with that. He can bring his own engineer in. His engineer could, could uh, appeal. We could lose the case. We would have to reverse our decision, and we could potentially have to pay his legal expenses. So I don't want that to happen. So my decision coming home from these courses was, you know what, let's hire somebody. MACC has <clears throat> implemented a program where we can imply, implore the, or cause the applicant to pay for an, a, either an, uh, an, an expert, in this case, to make this decision. And there are guys out there who do this for a living. It's, it's difficult for me to go into the, 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 these wetlands and feel the soil with my fingers and come up with a decision. Not only that, <clears throat> I'd probably put you to sleep telling you about our requirements to tell the difference between sandy loom or loomy sand, or mucky peat, or peaty muck. And hydric soils can, the hydric soils are the soils that are uh, in wetlands and they're called hydric because they are uh, flooded most of the year. So they, they are anaerobic, meaning they don't have any oxygen. And they change colors because of the aluminum oxide or ferrous metals that are, are in there, they're concentrated. So, there's, like I said, a thousand different colors. The day I took the, I decided to keep the trouble out of, keep, keep the town out of trouble. So anyway, there are people out there who could do a much better job than us, and I think it's, it makes more sense for us to have them guys come in. And that's what we've done in the last, I think we've had two cases where we weren't absolutely sure. Honestly, I can go into a, a site and, and within five minutes tell there's sensitive fern or there's skunk cabbage, or there's a red oak. And these are obligate species. They live there. They won't survive anywhere else. Maybe not red oak. Oak, oak is 50-50. But the other two species, skunk cabbage, for sure, for sure. Sensitive fern, for sure. If as soon as I see that, I know this is hydric soil. It, it supports these species. Therefore, that is a wetland. And we typically don't get challenged. I've, I've done the soil analysis on two or three occasions and it came out swimmingly fine. Anyway, the MACC offers all these eight different courses. and We're taught to lurk, work with local and state agencies. We have to study and, and make sure we abide by the open space uh, conflict of interest concerns. Karen will talk about our fees and our duties. Uh, obviously, we have to follow the open meeting law. We need to know the fundamentals of Wetland Protection Act. Uh, the permitting process, all the required forms, uh, understanding the plans, maps. I mean, honestly, when I started this, I, I really didn't know much about uh, forms or maps. I've, I've learned a lot. I can read maps pretty well now. 
uh, site date, site visit, data acquisition. We typically come home from a site visit with a clipboard full of information, an awful lot of pictures. Uh, it, what's really nice about today's technology is digital cameras. I can take a picture and then bring it in that night and show everybody on my laptop. So it's, it's quite nice. Uh, we need to know how to write relevant orders of conditions. We need, had, we, we need to do a site visit that's appropriate so when we give a certificate of compliance it really means something. Incidentally, and Karen will talk about this, certificates of compliance are, are necessary to get a, a lien on your deed. So some people that want to make, sell a house, if they've got an outstanding order of conditions, they can't get that lien off until the, the certificate of compliance will be done, that will do that. Uh, we're also responsible for protecting open space. There's been several parcels of land that have been donated to us or to the town and we're responsible for. Uh, these particular parcels uh, can't be developed, which is good in perpetuity. They can be used for recreation such as hunting and fishing, trapping, and even forestry and agriculture. Uh, like I said before, tutorials are offered throughout the year by MACC. They are cost, they do cost money, but we are reimbursed by the uh, filing fees, and Karen could talk about how that works. One more thing, uh, wetlands are unique bodies of land and water that act to buffer from surges of typically storm surges. Uh, that would otherwise flood low-lying areas. They act to filter dirty water. And I've actually been on site visits. I typically do my site visits with an umbrella and a raincoat, southwesters, or it's, it's the best time to do a site visit is when it's raining. And I've gone on construction sites and seen silting, muddy water flowing down from a construction site. Obviously, their erosion control measures either weren't there or they didn't work. Flowing into a wetland and then I walked down to the other side of the wetland and saw the same water coming out crystal clear. And that's really important. The problem is that that costs the wetlands in terms of its Im impeding doom because the silt stays there. And eventually, over years, maybe time, that wetland will fill up and eventually become <coughs> upland. That's really, be really bad. We don't want that to happen. I want to read you something, and maybe you can tell me who said this. I'm quoting someone that you all know. Wetlands trap, store, filter, and slowly release stormwater. They protect downstream property owners from pollution, flooding, and even drought. If I pave over a wetland to build a strip mall, I'm sure you know who it is now, and I remove that protection, and those downstream bear the consequences. It is indeed a trespass. An equally important consideration, one that's often overlooked, is how critical wetlands are to the national physical health and to American taxpayers. Wetlands, along with other vital water shed features, protect water quality, reduce flooding, replenish aquifers, and maintain stream flow. Best of all, they provide these services for free. Wetlands, when wet, I'm sorry, when wetlands are lost to development, they too so too are the free services that they once provided. Anybody got an idea? 1986, Ronald Reagan. He was very conscientious. I couldn't find it on the web. I looked for an hour and I couldn't find it, but I know he's, I'm pretty sure it was Ronald Reagan's idea, maybe not, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was in, instrumental in implementing the replication idea. So if you go into a wetland and take something, and sometimes we have to do that, we're doing it right now in town, we have to take a few square feet, actually it's 5,000, but we have to replicate. So we have to take 5,000 feet of another part of the same water body, it has to be contiguous, it has to be hydraulically connected, and take that upland and make it wetland. So the idea with Reagan was that we would never lose a square inch of, of, of uh, wetland. Okay, thank you for your time and attention. I've got lots more information. I could talk about this for hours. <laughs> Sean? Any questions? Council Manor? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. I do have one question. In regards to, I do have one question. In regards to the um, tornado back in 2011. In, in, what, I'm sorry. In regards to the tornado back in 2011, was there any um, damage done yes. to the wetlands yes. here in Southbridge? And how bad was that? 
some of the wetlands got filled in, and I think you can attest this to Mother Nature or attribute it to Mother Nature, which is something that happens. The, the biggest problem we had was damming of some of the brooks, natural damming, and we had to go in and open them up. We didn't. The Army Corps of Engineers and actually the uh, DEP, I'm not sure exactly the legal term, but they relinquished the law for I think it was six or eight months where you could actually work in the wetlands without contacting us. And thank goodness they did that because the town and DEP, the Army Corps of Engineers, a lot of contractors would just go in and just rip the stuff out of the, Katy Brook for instance was a very good example because the tornado went right across 169 and, and ripped up and filled in Katy Brook in two, two different places with major dams. And those dams were filling up and back flooding areas of homes. And the, uh, I'm not sure exactly who came in. Maybe it was the town no, that came in and actually state. had some heavy equipment in there to pull the stuff out before it caused major flooding. They didn't have to file with us to do that. Okay. This, those are still issues. We just had a, an applicant about a month ago that came back. She's still dealing with the consequences of the, the tornado. And it's three and a half years ago. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? Seeing none. Oh. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Um, thank you, Ken. Um, counselors and ladies and gentlemen, my, for those who don't know me, my name is Karen Loin, and this is my 12th year serving as the administrative assistant for the Conservation Commission. Uh, I'm not a member. Um, I take the minutes, I fill out the paperwork, and as Ken said, sometimes I pull out my legal background and, and help with some of those issues um, that can get a little sticky. Um, I've been asked to briefly summarize this evening the procedural part of what the Commission does. And so my plan is to just discuss the two most common permits that we issue, uh, which are the determination of applicability and the notice of intent, or the order of conditions. Um, first, the, the short form, the determination of applicability. Um, that's most often issued for a very small project that will have little or no impact to the wetland or buffer zone. For example, if you're installing a pool and your, you know, your work is going to cross 10 feet into the buffer zone, um, or the town is doing some roadway upgrades, and again, you're, you're going a few feet only into the buffer zone, not into the wetland. Um, that type of case um, would be appropriate for a request for determination of applicability. And what happens with that is one or more commissioners will go out and look at the site, first of all, um, determine where the wetlands are. Um, usually they meet with the applicant or the engineer, if there's an engineer on that particular project, um, and see what's going to be done. The applicant will fill out a short form. It's about three pages long, so it's really easy um, if you don't have an engineer uh, you, you know, a, a homeowner can handle it. Um, and then a public hearing notice is published at least one week in advance um, in a newspaper in the general area. At the hearing, the applicant uh, will discuss the proposed work and the commissioners will determine if any erosion control measures will need to be installed to prevent silt or uh, any material flowing into the wetland. Um, if the project will have no impact whatsoever, or we simply need to condition that hay bales and silt fence will be necessary, um, then the commissioners will vote to issue what's called a negative determination of applicability. And that permits the work, it, it covers the town, it covers the applicant, um, and everyone knows what's going to be done. The only cost for this small, uh, this shorter form permit, um, is the cost of the newspaper notice, which is required by law, and that usually runs about $50. If, on the other hand, the project is uh, going to have the potential to have a greater impact, um, or is working actually in the resource area, in the, right in the wetland, um, or is deep into the buffer zone, um, and that's whether that's a private um, t t kind of work, or whether it's a commercial um, entity, whether it's the town or the state, even the town and state have to file with the Conservation Commission by law, um, whether it's a single family house or an entire subdivision, whether it's a logging project, any, any type of work within the wetland um, that's going to actually be in the resource area, they have to file what's called a notice of intent. And that's the request 
um, that will result in an order of conditions, which is our long form permit, the standard permit that a conservation commission issues. Um, so the notice of intent is a work proposal. This is the, the outline of what um, the applicant would like to do. And this will definitely include engineered plans, um, not just a homeowner kind of drawing us a sketch. This one has to be actually by a, a civil engineer. Uh, and the entire filing along with the plans also gets set to the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. Um, and they, they review it as well and give us comments as to uh, you know, their, their, um, their analysis of whether it's sufficient um, to satisfy the law. Um, Again, the commissioners will go out and perform a site visit. Um, a public hearing notice will be published. And in this case, abutters are actually notified also by mail. Um, and then at the hearing, the applicant uh, will usually have the engineer present. Um, an applicant can present on their own. But normally, for a notice of intent, we have a civil engineer um, on the job. And they will present um, the, the proposed work. And then the applicant will uh, discuss what is uh, the, pr the plan and the commissioners will then determine if, if any changes to the plan are necessary to protect the wetlands or whether uh, the plan the engineer has um, come up with is sufficient to protect the wetlands involved. Um, they, they'll also determine uh, what types of conditions will have to be put into place to protect the wetland. Um, is it going to be hay bales or silt fans, uh, choir logs? Um, do we have to have a, a truck pad um, to remove the silt and, and debris from the trucks as they're rolling over the roads getting to? Are we, are we crossing a wetland as we're going to this project? Um, lots of things to be considered. Um, if the project simply cannot be modified to protect the wetland, um, then it can't go forward. Um, and an order of conditions would not be issued. Um, but this is extremely rare. Um, engineers generally know the law. They're not going to propose things that aren't going to satisfy the Wetlands Protection Act. And so most often it's a discussion between the engineer and the commissioners as to what methods are the best in this particular case to satisfy the law and to protect the wetland. And once that discussion is done, it, these are all open to the public, of course, open meeting law. Um, once the public has had a chance to comment, um, we close the public hearing and then the commissioners vote um, and decide on what conditions will go into the order. The fees for, um, for this are set, this is all set by statute by the Wetlands Protection Act. It has nothing to do with, with us. Um, and uh, so they're set by the state. They depend on the extent of the work. Part of the fee goes to the state to cover their administrative cost of review, and the other part remains here with us and can only be used to administer the Wetlands Protection Act. So that's a separate account that I'm sure you see on your, your reports from, um, from Mrs. Harnoy's. So to give you a ballpark, though, a single family house um, for an, an order of conditions, the fee is about $500. And again, that's mandated by state. Half goes to the state, and a little over half stays here with us. Um, the order of conditions then gets filed at the Registry of Deeds, and as Ken said, it becomes a lien on the property, um, which then gets released when the work is all done and the applicant comes back to the commission and asks for a certificate of compliance. And at that point, another site visit, um, they come to the, the commission, they vote. If everything has been done in accordance, we don't see any violations um, of the Wetlands Protection Act, will issue the certificate of compliance. That also gets recorded and releases the, it's not really a lien, but it's, it's, it's a bar on title. You can't, the bank isn't going to let you sell your house if you have an open order of conditions. They want to make sure that you've got the certificate of compliance. Um, the only other uh, paperwork that, that I probably should mention is, um, number one, the enforcement order. If a homeowner or other person or entity performs work within a wetland or buffer zone without having obtained a permit, the commission will issue an enforcement order if they, if they see that happening, which states that the work must immediately stop, the violator must appear before the commission, and take measures to restore the protected area to its original state. You have one, two, maybe per year we'll get a call or, or the commissioners will be out and they'll see somebody doing something in or near the wetland and, and you know, they'll They'll make contact with them and, hey, what's going on? You know, what are you doing? Did you know you can't, you know, you can't do that? Um, and so they'll have to come in and we'll have to figure out how they can restore that. 
Um, and one other thing I should mention is an emergency order. Um, if, if something has to be done immediately, we can't wait, you know, having a meeting, we meet every two weeks approximately. Sometimes something, uh, in, for example, with the flooding in, in 2005, something has to be done immediately. We can also issue an emergency order. One commissioner can sign it and um, it just says that within a, a certain time frame they have to come back to the commission and explain, uh, you know, what they had to do and why. Um, and, and we go forward from there and we make sure that the pro appropriate paperwork is filed. But if, if something has to be done in an emergency situation, um, there, you know, the, the law allows for that, of course. Um, so altogether, these are the most basic functions of the commission. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any other questions you might have about our procedures. Anybody else have any questions, comments? Just a, excuse me. Are you looking for members? How are you? Yes, we, I, I think we have one seat open right now. So we, yes, we would love that. It makes it hard to get a quorum if we don't have mm -hmm. everybody. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? Thank you both very much for coming out and informing us. <coughs> Moving on to agenda item number nine, citizens forum. If we have any residents or citizens here that would like to speak on something that is not on tonight's agenda, uh, now is your opportunity. Going once, twice. Um, hi, uh, Maureen Doyle, um, 771 Lebanon Hill, Southbridge. Um, I'm here um, to letting everybody know about on Wednesday, the Historical Society is having a program called 1776 Remembered. Um, should be an interesting talk. And we meet at the Art Center, which is on 11, 111 Main Street um, in Southbridge. And it's at 7 p.m. And it is November 12th, Wednesday. So hope to see you all there. Thank you. Do we have anyone else for Citizens Forum? Okay. Seeing none, we move on to agenda item number 10. <clears throat> Vote to ratify the health insurance renewals for two Blue Cross Blue Shield and Fallon Senior plans effective January 1, 2015 through December 31, 2015. So moved. Second. And I will turn it over to the manager. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the council, you have the rate increases before you. Happy to chat about any questions. Um, if there are any, it's pretty straightforward, I think. <clears throat> and I believe the subcommittee has considered this um, already. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Okay. Seeing none, roll call, please. Councilor Clemens? Yes. Councilor Estrada? Yes. Councilor Mana? Yes. Councilor Moriarty? Yes. Councilor Vandal? Yes. Councilor Vecchia? Yes. Councilor Crasco? Yes. Seven yes. Motion carries. Agenda item number 11, vote to ratify the changes to Schedule 5 to reflect the change to minimum wage from $8 per hour to $9 per hour effective January 1, 2015, according to Mass General Law, Chapter 144 of the Acts of 2014. So moved. Second. Any questions or comments or discussion? Seeing none, roll call please. Councilor Estrada? Yes. Councilor Mana? Yes. Councilor Moriarty? Yes. Councilor Vandal? Yes. Councilor Vecchia? Yes. Councilor Crosco? Yes. Councilor Clemens? Yes. Seven yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Agenda item number 12, vote to ratify the changes to Schedule 5 to reflect the added position of temporary loader operator snow removal at the Southbridge Municipal Airport at an hourly rate of $25.10. This is the same rate as a DPW heavy equipment operator. So moved. Second. Any questions, comments, or discussion? Okay. Seeing none, roll call please. Councilor Mana? Yes. Councilor Moriarty? Yes. Councilor Vandal? Yes. Councilor Vecchia? Yes. Councilor Crosco? Yes. Councilor Clements? Yes. Councilor Estrada? Yes. Seven yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Moving on to agenda item number 13, vote to approve the formation of the Regional Veterans District subject to the requirements of Mass General Law, Chapter 115. So, so moved. moved. Second. Any questions, comments, or discussion? Councilor Vecchia. Uh, through the Chairman to the Town Manager, um, you state in your uh, memo here 
that Chowton is going to propose to pay $16,000 of the regional director's salary. Um, <laughs> this position includes benefits? No. No, no, but I mean the position includes benefits. The uh, veteran service officer? Or the, re or the rec director? No. The regional veterans district, are we going to have, so we're going to have a, whoever has this position, it's going to be a regional position. Correct. Chowton's going to pay us $16,000. Correct. But they're so, not paying any of the benefits. No, that's not. That's At the present time, no. That's part of the $16,000 fee, but that's just for a partial fiscal year. That's for half the year, because this will be starting December 1 or January 1, we're not sure yet, so that's just a partial year. Next year, that fee will increase. But this memo really has nothing to do with the vote here because we're going to be voting for the formation of the regional veterans district. Correct. So it doesn't really matter who's paying what. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions, comments, or discussion? Seeing none. Roll call, please. Councilor Moriarty? Yes. Councilor Vandal? Yes. Councilor Vecchia? Yes. Councilor Crosco? Yes. Councilor Clements? Yes. Councilor Estrada? Yes. Councilor Mana? Yes. Seven yes? Thank you. Motion carries. Agenda item number 14, vote to accept an anonymous donation in the amount of $5,000 to be used for the holiday lights at the Southbridge Town Common, said lights to be installed by a completely voluntary citizens group. So moved. Second. Any other questions, comments, or discussion? Just want to say thank you to the anonymous donor for such a generous offer. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Vandal? Yes. Councilor Vecchia? Yes. Councilor Crosco? Yes. Councilor Clemens? Yes. Councilor Estrada? Yes. Councilor Mana? Yes. Councilor Moriarty? Yes. Councilor Van, I'm sorry, I already got you. Seven yes. Motion carries. Agenda item number 15, uh, vote to re approve the request of the Southbridge Middle High School to have their annual bonfire on Wednesday, November 26, 2014 at 7 p.m. according to 527 CMR 10.23, uh, Section 1, and as outlined in letter from the Southbridge Fire Department dated November 3, 2014. So moved. Second. Any questions, comments, or discussion? Just as a note, this is more so uh, we are the, the authority that would have to vote on this uh, as opposed to, say, the school committee uh, because of the fire component. And uh, as a note, the bonfire on that day, the Wednesday, uh, November 26th, the night before Thanksgiving, they have the bonfire, they have the parade, uh, they will have uh, an alumni game uh, and all sorts of other things going on at McMahon Field, leading up to McMahon Field, and it's a really great community event. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? Seeing none, roll call, please. Councilor Vecchia? Yes. Councilor Crosco? Yes. Councilor Clements? Yes. Councilor Estrada? Yes. Councilor Mana? Yes. Councilor Moriarty? Yes. Councilor Vandal? Yes. Seven yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Agenda item number 16, vote to appropriate $27, uh, $27,000. <laughs> That'd be quite the deal. Uh, from the landfill reimbursement fund, uh, receipts reserved, account number 6785 to the Landfill Comparability Study, account to fund the contract with CLOW, Harbor, and Associates, LLP, CHA. So moved. Second. Okay. And we will start with Councillor Vecchia. Um, I have the same question that uh, Councillor Vandell will have. Do we have paperwork on this? Um, paperwork of what nature? Well, the backup by my uh, vote. Uh, there's a contract um, uh, request for proposals and contract available. If you'd like to see those, sure. But it wasn't it wasn't put in my packet. No, we didn't put that. Uh, I'm told this is a routine thing that you've all seen before, and it's something that's done every couple of years. Well, I don't know. I wasn't here two years ago, so I didn't see it. Okay, this is a study that's done periodically. Um, in order to determine if the money that's being given to the town from Casella is competitive with other landfills and other communities in the state. The only way you can know if you're getting fair payment from them 
is to compare it to other municipally hosted landfills. So this study does that. It's 100 percent funded by Casella. The taxpayers do not pay for it. Um, and when the report's done, it becomes very informative to us uh, to indicate whether we need to do something uh, with those payments or not. Um, you s to the ch I'm not done. To the chairman, to the town manager. You say it's funded by Casella, but you're asking us to take it out of our, our money. The way it works is they donate it, and then you have to appropriate it from the donation. The appropriation is an authorization to spend. I can't spend it without you appropriating it. Where's it could also be gifted, in which case you'd have to accept the gift and then we could expend it. It's kind of a semantical thing. Where's the donation? It comes from Casella. I know that. Do we, do we have the donation? We, we won't have it until you first authorize the study, and then they will make the donation so we can fund it. But there, there is paperwork on this that I could see. Yes, sure. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Just call um, Yvonne or send her an email, and she'll send you a contract, proposals, whatever you'd like. I'm sure she's watching the just, just so that everyone understands, the proposals is a stack of paper yay thick. Um, we would appreciate if we didn't have to photocopy all that. If um, well, I, don't th I think there's only one copy in the office, so um, if you could come in and view it. Uh, we can't. They're original, so we can't. No, no, no. That's okay. I'll, I'll come in and view it. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Thank you. Councilor Manor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, I just was looking for clarification, um, like Council Vandal and Council Vecchia, and Mr. Pecos clarified it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I apologize, members of the Council. I would have written you a memo, but I was advised this is routine. You've done this a number of times before, so my apologies. Councilor Clements. Thank you. Um, just looking at, this, is, this has to do with the seven-year look-back clause. Yes. And we've, but we brought this up a year or two ago, um, and I thought we did vote on doing the study. So, but you can't find anything on it? I can't tell you if you did or you didn't. Uh, all I know is that um, <clears throat> this was brought to my attention, and um, I thought it was uh, critically important to get it done right away. So I began steps to solicit proposals, get the proposals, negotiate with Casella, and get it in front of you as quickly as I could. So if, they, if I'd known there'd been a previous vote, I wouldn't have um, taken your time to do this, but I don't know if there was, so. I, I'm not, I can't guarantee that there was a vote. I can just say I do know that this was brought up before the seven-year period because you want to be done, you want to have it sooner than later. And I right. thought Casella was, in, was, I would say anxious, Casella was also very interested in, in moving the process forward. So I thought we had already done this, but. Yeah, they, I mean, they actually brought it to my attention that, it hadn't been that they moved wanted forward. to do it. I think it, we right? started yeah. it, and whether we vote, we may have, but I guess this would just be clean up and making sure think, that we voted on it. It's I not think it just slipped through the cracks during the transition from um, uh, Manager Clark's departure and, you know, a couple of interrupts. Yeah, he was here when we started the process. Yeah. So. For, for what it's okay. worth, uh, if the council is so uh, inclined. I would entertain a motion to postpone this till the next meeting, which is a week from tonight, uh, because I have a similar recollection that this was discussed, I want to say, 12 to 18 months ago um, at that point. Um, and rather than take an action that's already been taken or an action that counselors have any sort of reservation because they've not seen anything. I'm not making the motion. I'm saying I would entertain that motion. Council comments? In regard to your comments, the only thing I could say was that we hadn't hired somebody, and now you're saying the request for proposal went out. We now have a contract based on that request for proposal, with, or you're proposing the contract be with Clow Harbor and Associates. Yes, and I have awarded that contract, and the contractors, the successful bidder has been notified. Um, subsequent to all that having happened, right. I was then told that because this is a donation to the account, that you have to take a vote of appropriation for me to actually be able to spend the money. So, right, which is why many things come to. Would have been good if I'd known that prior to doing all that. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> but as a practical matter, if the council, for whatever reason, doesn't want to go forward with a study, um, I'll cancel the contract. They won't make the donation, but then we will have the disadvantage of not knowing if the payments we receive are or are not competitive. Right. Well, the, the point I'm making is I believe we agreed there needed to be the study, but there was no name to a contractor. So you've moved forward with the contractor part, so technically the vote would not be a duplicate vote because we'd be awarding the, con we'd be going with this particular company, is what 
because there was no company before. We hadn't sent a, propose, a request for proposal out. Jeremy, we voted, I believe, or we discussed at least the need to do it and, to, and that we all were in agreement. But we didn't, we, didn't have a con we didn't have a contract with anybody. Yeah, you're not awarding. So this is a new, I mean, this is new in that sense. Right. You're not awarding a contract with this vote. You're funding the contract. Right. You are the appropriating authority. Right. I understand. So yes. you must vote to appropriate, i.e., to allow the money to be spent. Right. The manager awards the contract, but you authorize the spending of the money. Right. So both of us have to act in order for this to go forward. Right. So again, I just repeat myself, we, even if we did vote to move forward with wanting to have the study, we hadn't made any appropriate, we hadn't done anything concrete in order to award it to a specific contractor, which is what this is now about. Uh, to I'm to not spend sure the money I to understand the question. Well, there was no name. Well, it says to fund the contract with. Right. We didn't have a with when we might have discussed it in the past. Oh, that could be, yeah. Do probably. you understand? There was no name. There was no, there was no with. There was no who's the money going to. Okay. Your proposal is the money's going to these people. Yes. Okay. So I personally don't have a problem then if that's the case because. It's, it's, not, it's redundant, but not. It's, it's got an added component that we didn't have previously. Okay. So that's, okay, that's thank you. Yep, I'm good. Crespin. Yeah, I just, I believe we did speak about this when um, Casella came and gave us an update um, at downstairs. Um, they, they talked about um, the importance of this and they, they wanted to know, we wanted, the town wanted to know if we were getting paid correctly. Um, and they, they kind of, I don't want to be quoted, misquoted, but um, my recollection was that, you know, right now there's not many landfills in the area. And one of the things was that part of the proposal was that we had to reach out to other landfills uh, that do similar um, work that is being done up there. That's so correct. I, We're looking at <coughs> landfills in Maine, New Hampshire, New York, in order to get the, the desired 10 comparable landfills, we actually have to go out of state because you're quite right that they're closing and there's not that many municipally contracted ones anymore. So it's, uh, it's, it's getting more and more difficult to make a comparison. Yeah. And now just to understand this correctly, we the taxpayer are not paying for this study. That's correct. It's fully funded by Casella. Yep. Thank you. That's all I have. Councilor Vecchia. <clears throat> all right. Th through the uh, chairman to the town manager. We're voting to fund the contract. Where is the contract? The contract. Do you have a contract? Yes, we do. So can I see the contract? Yes, you can. That has nothing to do with the big stack of papers you want no. to read. But you have the contract? Yes. And how many pages is the contract? I think it's two. Well, I haven't seen the contract. I'd like to see the contract before I vote it. But, okay, thank you. I'm all set. Just, just once again, the council is not approving the contract. That's not the vote you're taking. So if there was something in the contract that somebody wanted to change, you can't do that. Um, the council doesn't have authority in that area. The manager does. But you decide whether or not to go forward with this purpose by funding it or not. Now, I'm happy to give anybody the contract. It's a public document. But I don't want there to be a misperception okay. Thank that you the very contract much. can come back to the council for amendment that can't. Okay. I, it's I, all been I, duly awarded according to Master in Law Chapter 30B, the procurement law, and it is not. Just to, I, I, I apologize. Like, I'm not sure what the confusion is no, here because I was told this was very routine. There's and no confusion. Just that when I vote on something, I don't like to vote in the blind. I like to see everything in front of me. Sure. Okay. I'm all set. I think we have, mm -hmm. a, after the council, I think we have a citizen who wants us. We do. Okay. Mr. Palosky. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm John Palosky, 3 Genesis Street. There's some concerns I have, uh, especially, uh, Mr. Town Manager, when you say they suggest it's routine. This is our first review, and I'm not an attorney, as everyone knows. None of us are. And I'm concerned about the language in the contract. If the clock, so to speak, starts seven years from when the contract was signed or seven years from when the contract was approved by the DEP. The reason I'm concerned about doing it this year, where we would pay 27,000, they would pay 27,000, I feel we would do much better next year 
if we were to pay 27,000. The reason being, this information is current from the DEP site up to at 8:27 this evening. Currently, there are 15 uh, municipal solid waste landfills in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Now, I know it's brevity in the agenda as it needs to be, but even Southbridge, according to the DEP, is not a municipal landfill. We have only in this state four municipal landfills run by a municipality. We have one that's a district landfill managed by the district, seven that are private and managed by the private, and we are in the municipal private hybrid where uh, we're municipally owned and run by the but the reason we would do better to even pay for it ourselves next year, if we're allowed to by the contract, is that by the end of 2015, there's only going to be, double check my numbers, yes, seven municipal landfills in this state. So of course, with there being a greater demand, certainly there may be a greater price. Some people, for example, if you were to call and inquire about buying uh, stock, so let's say, of Casella from a broker, they'll tell you that the price of uh, garbage is going to, of landfills is going to possibly double in as much as two years in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts because of this very thing. Now, in your, in your uh, agenda tonight, it specifically says municipal landfills. We are only going to have four municipal landfills left in the state at the end of 2015. So if we're doing a study of only the municipal landfills, and that may not be the case, it may be because of the brevity necessary in the agenda, we're overlooking the, uh, the private landfills. And I don't understand <clears throat> why if we have a privately owned landfill, see, we're competing at the same level. So whether or not we're owned by the town or owned by a private, I don't <clears throat> see why the private landfill should be excluded. So just if, if it may be worth uh, the town's, oh, pardon me, go, go ahead, sir. Let, let me help here. The word municipal does not appear on the agenda anywhere. Thank you. The wording is to appropriate 27000 from the landfill reimbursement funds receipt reserved account. That is an account set up to receive yes, the, the, the money to the landfill comparability study account, which is an account which is set up to then spend the money. Um, <clears throat> to fund the contract with Clough Harbor and Associates, the consultant that won the, won the bid. Um, <clears throat> the study is not to study municipal landfills. Municipal landfills have no comparability to ours. Municipal landfills are run and operated by the taxpayer's cost and don't pay the taxpayers anything. This is a <clears throat> private landfill occupying town-owned land. Because the landfill occupies the tax, the um, the citizen's land, the vendor makes payments to the town. The purpose of the study is to look at similar landfills, not municipal landfills. We don't look at those. We look at landfills that are privately operated on public land and which pay their host communities money or other things. And what we want to find out is if the payments we're getting from Casella are comparable to what other communities are receiving for their hosting of a landfill. In other words, this study is very much in the taxpayer's best interest. Moreover, the selection process, although Casella pays for this, we issue the request for proposals, we solicit the proposals, and the town makes the award. So we're hiring a third-party expert, not Casella, even though they're paying for it, so that we remove the possibility of a conflict and any sort of um, any sort of opportunity to represent things more favorably for Casella than, than they ought to be. So it's an arm's length, subject, uh, objective transaction, very much in the people's best interest. Well, only, only, but if it's done next year, sir, the price of landfills, or even the, in the year after, the ton that we would find, discover the prices could be as much as twice as high. That's and that exactly, way it wouldn't be in our advantage. That's exactly the kind of thing we want to find out with the study. All right, because the way it was written in the contract, the study's done, and from that study it determines what the new rate will be. And if the new rate is based on a study done, if that study can somehow psychically look into what the price will be in two years, that'll be great. But if that's not in the study... I think you're confusing the contract with Casella for the contract with Clough Harbor. Yes, sir, the I The contract with Clough Harbor 
who's going to conduct the study. It's just two pages. It's an engagement letter, basically, with a few standard conditions. The contract with Casella is a very, very extensive document, many dozens of pages long. That is not up for renewal and negotiation. That contract expires when the landfill expires in well, a few years. Respectfully, sir, I, I was very involved in that, and there is a period of time, I believe it's every seven years, where we renegotiate the tonnage rate. And I thought that this contract, this work, was going to be used to determine what the next tonnage rate would be in seven years. It could be if there's some, some conclusion to the study which suggests that an adjustment would be appropriate then it could, in fact, be the basis for Okay, well, that. I just yes. I wanted to share these things because, unfortunately, I dream about landfills <laughs> uh, or have nightmares about landfills. And I, I, I wish we talked more about money seven years ago than health and the environment because we may have had a different conclusion. But uh, thank you for your time. And I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to see the council's being prudent about uh, going forward with this. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I have Councillor Vandal. I'm um, almost that. Your side? Councillor Vecchia? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, through you to the town manager. So, can you give me a scope of what this study is for? What's the study for? Sure. It's going to take a look at seven, I think, designated landfills that are on lease sites in Massachusetts. Um, it's going to look at all the different kinds of payments that those landfills make to their host communities. Um, we've targeted up to, I think, three or four additional landfills. Um, wherever we can find them. As I say, we have to go out of state to find any more and do the same thing with those. And what we're trying to find out is if the fees that the um, commercial landfill pays to their host community are similar to, less than, or more than what Casella pays to us. And, Ca and Casella is funding this? They are, as a condition of their operator's license. Oh, good, very good point. Thank you. Almost said. Councillor Carrasco. Yeah, um, through you, Mr. Chair, I, I would like to make a request um, through, to our town manager. It's been more than six months since Casella has come in and given us an update on the landfill. I know the last time we met, they were supposed to come every three to four months. Um, so if we can schedule another meeting <laughs> to get an update, you know, since this is very uh, a touchy subject, I, I would like to get more information moving forward on Casella. Thank you. Are there any other questions, comments, concerns? Seeing none, uh, just briefly that uh, on my end, um, uh, to err on the side of safety, I'll, vote, I'll be voting no on this only because I just don't feel that we have the clarification uh, universally, if you will, as to what happened when, what did or didn't happen, and so forth. Um, and, and in that regard, I wish we had more information. Uh, uh, and, and I think, uh, I forget which council brought it up, but this is one that I think should have been uh, a subcommittee item to be vetted further. Councilor Vandal? I'm going to be voting no for the same reason. Thank you. Council Man? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, if this was to be postponed till um, next week, we could get it on an agenda item next week. Um, possibly the town manager, perhaps, or we could go through our notes from last year, because now I'm vaguely remembering some of what everybody's saying. Things are coming back to me, but it would be nice to see some notes, some minutes or something. Um, I, I don't want to see this voted down, right. um, but if we could postpone this possibly until next week, until everybody gets the clarification that they're desiring. Right. As I, as I noted, to my recollection, it was somewhere between 12 to 18 months ago that we had a discussion, but to my memory, I don't recall if there was an action or if it was just a, one of the general updates with Casella that was just a discussion item. I, I remember there were some talks at some subcommittees before I was on town council in regards to the look-back letter mm -hmm. um, that Council Clemens brought up. Um, I believe there was some discussion up here when I first got elected to council, and you were talking about the meeting that we had downstairs in the veterans. Mm -hmm. Correct, yes. Yep. Council Clemens? There is general government on Wednesday, and while it's not a complete 48 hours, it would be prudent perhaps to, to add it and give enough notice because of the fact that we've had a general government every week, and next week there's a lot of meetings already scheduled. I wouldn't have a problem with another agenda item. On the other hand, I have a question through you, Mr. Pecos. 
is there a timeliness factor on the contract, on the, on the award of what you did, uh, you know, in terms of the, uh, I mean, we, I don't think anyone's in disagreement that we want to study. So, <coughs> yeah, I'm I, a little I, con <coughs> Yes and no <laughs> is the answer. Okay. But let me explain again. Um, when I put the RFP out at the urging of the Board of Health, Cassell, and basically everyone who was saying to me, we need to get this study going, um, and I just remind the council, this was on your goals and objectives. You did discuss this. You did approve it. Um, and so I was under the impression everybody was in agreement, you know, we move forward. So I issued the request for proposals, uh, received the proposals, um, went through them, uh, made, a, made an award. And it was only at that point when I'd made the award, thinking that the money was already in, um, in the budget and approved, that I was told, no, they, they actually make a donation and then the council moves that money from the donation account to the account where we can then spend it. So I didn't know that till after this was all done. Um, so if it pleased the council, I'm, I'm more than happy to do anything you'd like. I just need to know what it is you want me to do. do you, if you're more comfortable, I'll bring it to the subcommittee. Um, I'll tell the vendor that uh, the bid award is on hold. Um, I hope they've not begun any work. Um, but I'm sure in good faith they'd be happy to, you know, hold off. And I'm quite certain once we get through whatever due diligence you'd like to see, the proposals, the RFP, the contract, whatever it is you'd like, I'm sure you'll have every confidence that this is very, very well thought out and, you know, intelligently arrived at and will then um, appropriate this money. But again, we don't do the study unless you want the study because if you don't want the study, they don't give us the money and then I can't do the study. So we're not appropriating taxpayer money, we're appropriating a gift from them which they are required to give us by their operating license, but it only goes forward if you say so. Yeah, I'm good. So, we're, are we looking to postpone this? Is that what people want to do? I mean, right now there's a motion on the table for this particular item, but so we could make, you know. That would be the will of the council. I would support a motion. Yeah. I was going to make yes. right. So, you can either, okay, we can make another motion, then a motion to postpone um, until we have further clarification at the next general government meeting. I'll second that. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Any discussion on the? I, I still have a question. All right. Okay. Who who got these people? Cloth, cloth Harbor, and Associates. Who you know hired these people? Where, where did these people come from? They were one of four proposers, one of four companies that proposed, and they were a judge to be the most experienced at this particular kind of. A because contract. I don't like the idea where Casella pays. All right. If when Casella pays. Who are, who are the companies liable to, you know? Um, <clears throat> I discarded one company because they have <clears throat> a relationship with Casella. I discarded our current vendor because I don't think our current cons uh, consultant to the landfill, um, which um, is, in a, is not in a position to be completely objective, and that brought it down to only two companies, and between the two, uh, this company was the most um, uh, experienced in this area by in terms of what they presented in their proposal right. and their paycheck is coming from the town of Southbridge even though it's technically underwritten by Casella right correct thank you thank you Mr. Baker okay. right. so we have a motion to table uh, not uh, table I'm sorry postpone, postpone. postpone. Like could you postpone. repeat what the motion was just motion so. to postpone any action on this agenda item 16, 16 thank you um, until further discussion and clarification at the November 12th general government meeting which is Wednesday we'll just send out a memo that uh, the agenda has been updated with that additional item is that sure okay in the interest of time may I ask the council would there be any objection to having this back on the agenda for the 17th and the reason I'm making that request is because um, if it isn't and it waits till December, then that will delay the study for another three weeks. Um, and I, I don't think that's in the public's best interest because I think we need to get this study done and presented to you. The consultant will be coming here to give you a presentation on his findings. Um, and I think, you know, delay is not in the public's best interest. We want to get this study 
up and done. I believe that is the intention of the motion. Okay, so we could put it back on for the 17th Correct. and on the General That's Government good. Subcommittee agenda for the 12th. Assuming that that meeting is held in the event of some unlikely circumstance. Right. And, and if you look at the contract, page 35, and the information about the seventh anniversary effective day, and then the market study under B, I mean, you know, certainly we're kind of behind the ball, 14 years being, you know, in 2014, and we're getting to the end of 14. So certainly we want to, which is why we discussed it a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where it didn't, why it didn't go forward, but it is, I think, important. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. So any other discussion on the motion on the floor? Seeing none, roll call, please. Councilor Kraska? Yes. Councilor Clements? Yes. Councilor Estrada? Yes. Councilor Mana? Yes. Councilor Moriarty? Yes. Councilor Vandal? Yes. Councilor Vecchia? Yes. Seven yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item number 17, Councilor's Forum. And uh, we will start with, uh, to my left, our, our veteran councilor, Mr. Oh, Vandal. I, thank you. I've got a problem here. A couple of people called me recently and told me that the leaf and the grass and leaf bags that you know you can buy for the leaves and stuff, they're all the places that carry them are all out of them. You know, I don't know if anybody knew that, and I, I didn't know where to direct them. I think one of them said I called uh, the lady that the secretary for the uh, Casella, and she said she was going to look into it. But in the meantime. This is the leaf raking season, and people probably rake leaves today, and I don't know, you know, they don't know what to do with them. They can't put them in plastic bags, so, so you know, and Casella is the one that dis distributes them to the <coughs> stores that sell them. All right, now they should have known in advance, you, you know, had they should have had plenty, because you don't have to. They, we don't need them in December. We need them now. So I wish somebody would, you know. I'll, I'll check on that tomorrow, well, uh, no, Wednesday morning. All right, <laughs> fine. Thank you. All set? Thank you. Councilor Vecchia? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, through the Chairman to the Town Manager, um, the two of us have been working on the legal fees, and we've got a handle on the last five years, the Town side, but we don't have a handle on the School Committee side. And I'd like to, s somebody should go over to the school committee and tell them we want the legal fees for the last five years. I don't think we should have to wait for that, okay? I mean, they have to play ball with us. They're gonna be coming with a budget and everything else, and I like to have it all completely together, okay? We both know that the town side, the last five years, is like $475,000 we spent on legal fees, and there's like 11 different law firms we use. But I would like you to call up the superintendent and tell the business manager that we want that information. I, I want the council to know that I've done that. Um, and I know I you've done that. stress the urgency I of know it. you've done that, but, but I don't know what I, more but, I can do. Well, you say there's no more you can do, but uh, we should be able to look at the books. When uh, 13 years ago, when I was chairman of education, I looked at those <coughs> books every single week, and I had a handle on all the figures that the school department was paying. Okay, we approved their budget, all right? And I would put a fire out and, and there's no, when they come to us for money, when they want money and so forth, and we can't get the records we're, we're seeking, okay? I'm gonna look the other way because I think they're spending too much money, all right, on legal fees. Seems to me everybody's getting sued. So I like to see those figures. 11, 12 years ago, I had to go see the superintendent and I had to get the books myself and I had to look at the books myself. And I used to look at those books every month for a whole year. All right, and I found a lot of things going on. All right, some of which were shocking. <coughs> so I like those records. Second thing is. Can I make a suggestion? Yes. Um, I, I would like to suggest that perhaps the chairman of the council reach out to the chairman of the school committee take it above yeah. my authority and great. stress that. I also um, want to um, uh, advise the council there will be a vote on your next agenda on the 17th on an additional appropriation to the school budget because of the additional state aid that you received. Um, and perhaps that's an opportunity to stress the importance while discussing budgetary matters um, and extra funding for the school budget of the importance of providing the information for the current budget. 
Oh, okay, two things. Uh, back to the chairman. Will you do that for us? Certainly. I, I, I like those records, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, they had enough time to produce them. Thank you very much. Uh, my second question to the town manager, to the chairman, is the deputy chief's exam, uh, do you know when that's going to be taken? I believe it's December 2nd or 3rd. So it is coming up <coughs> December 2nd and 3rd? Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's very good. Thank you very much. That's all I have tonight. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Manna. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. First, I'd like to um, thank all the veterans um, within our community, our state, everywhere, all over the country. You guys are the backbone of our nation. You protect us here at home. You protect us abroad. You, you, give, you, give, it, you give it your all. And um, I, I just want to thank the veterans, past and present, and also their families. Um, I also want to say happy birthday to the Marines, 239 years, wow. And I also want to thank Mr. Satili um, for his service and to his commitment for the Toys for Tots program. That's a, a, a wonderful program for the, um, those who aren't as fortunate as other children. But we also must remember the true meaning of Christmas. Um, I also want to thank the community. November 4th, we had a 51% voter turnout. I was absolutely amazed. I, I you know, that was just, it, it was amazing to see the turnout. I was at the polls the majority of the day. There were backups from down Chestnut Street to Main Street, 10 minutes to seven before the polls even opened. There was a line going around the building. It was just absolutely amazing to see the people come out and, and exercise their right. And um, hopefully we can see a, another turnout like that come June. I mean, town elections are just as important as state elections, if not more important, because government starts here at home. Um, and that's all I have to say about that. Uh, and also to um, you, Mr. Chair, I guess this would be a question. The um, town council and school committee, um, the joint meeting that we had, I didn't see any minutes in our packet. Um, I would like to see them soon. I mean, mm -hmm. I feel it's very important. Yep. And, um, and I, I do want to stress also that hopefully at the next joint school committee meeting we can have a discussion on the MCAS results and whatnot, um, and maybe perhaps some counselor input on the agenda. That would be greatly appreciated also. As for the meeting minutes anyways, uh, uh, due to what I will term as a communication error, I guess, uh, they had, there was no uh, uh, recording secretary there. I know, if I recall, Ms. Quinney helped take some notes, as well as uh, uh, Councillor Steves, um, and I believe that the intent was that they were going to kind of collaborate to, to meld that together. I have not heard anything. I will reach out to, to do my due diligence on that and, and see uh, where they are on that and see if anybody else did it as far as uh, taking notes and such. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Uh, Councilor Estrada. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, people. Uh, today, I want to the honor the better on the day tomorrow. Um, Home run, from Paco, Wonder. I'll make a tumble. Congratulations for today for a better than day. Um, um, I want to congratulate on Senator Fatma and Mr. Durant for the victory they on the, the last Tuesday. Two people that made the promise of the city. Consul Estrada, I'm going to the member every day and walk through the street. So if any, you help in housing, work, and equity for the people. Consul Estrada, remember day to day you promise. Um, I want to invite the community to the appointment next Wednesday in community center. We are going to raise the house, the sport facility, and help the sport in the city. I hope. 6 p.m. in community center. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Clements. Thank you. Um, just on the uh, agenda item number 16, I'm just requesting that uh, Mr. Pecos make sure he gets whatever pertinent information he feels would be important to the uh, committee members or councillors who may or may not uh, go uh, prior to Wednesday this uh, by email. Or it's this Wednesday night, right? It's this right. Wednesday, so t uh, tell, the, tell somebody tomorrow's Tuesday. So <laughs> would like an email. Well, nothing's um, going to happen tomorrow. I will email my group tonight <laughs> to let them know that there's an added item. I'll yeah, the only thing that we're going to be able to do is try to get what, you, what we can electronically mm -hmm. Wednesday morning, mm -hmm. and then we'll have to bring to the meeting. And then we'll, then we'll take some time to review it really okay. carefully. We'll, we'll bring the proposals. Um, okay. So. Sounds good. I just want to be clear that we should have as much information as possible. Because that's and, always and, and by the way. And then the rest will have it, obviously, for longer to review. While I think it's important to get this study underway, if the committee doesn't feel Wednesday night that you've had enough time, mm -hmm. then I think it's more important mm -hmm. that the committee get to a comfort level. So if we have to postpone it, we'll right. postpone it. Okay. Okay, very good. Thanks. Now, um, holiday season's upon us. Uh, there are a number of things happening, uh, as you're hearing already. Toys for Tots and all that is kicking off their campaign. Well, some of us citizens are kicking off our uh, Holiday Visions campaign here for Southbridge. You've heard it before. This year is especially important. Um, it's in memory of Rudy, of course. Uh, Rudy was working on a wonderful uh, new display for the Town Common, which I think everyone will find delightful when it's out there. But it has to get out there. Um, and so whoever's listening out there in TV land or, or here, or maybe you've got um, other people you can share this message with, this weekend is, is a big push to um, get a lot of things out into town. I say things, you know, Christmas trees, reindeer, Santa Claus, and these new, these new items that are going to the common. Skids are heavy. The, wood, the work that Rudy did is heavy. It's, um, he did a great job, and that's why it still exists. That's why we can use it every year. Um, but without bodies, without people to lift items and, and move things, um, some, not everything is as heavy, but without the, the people who are willing to come out and actually help us do this, um, it makes it really hard for just a few people to try to decorate the entire town, or at least Main Street and the lower level of Southbridge. So, if you have any time on your hands on Saturday or Sunday, uh, we will start at 9 a.m. Um, loading trucks down on Mill Street. It's uh, at the, in the old mill building there. Um, you'll see vehicles parked outside at second floor. Um, and people will be starting at 9 o'clock loading vehicles, which will then um, go to Main Street, go to the Common. Um, if you can't show up at 9 o'clock, maybe you want to come at noon, maybe you want to come at 2 o'clock, because I'm sure we'll still be working at 2 o'clock. Um, feel free. Find us, find, a, find us at the Common. Find us back at the Mill. We'll be loading the truck over and over and over and bringing things to town to try to make it look uh, more like the holiday season. Um, and we could really use some help. This will go on again on Sunday, because I can't imagine in my wildest dreams um, that we'll get it all done on Saturday. Um, so again, we some will be there at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning and continue the efforts until dusk to try to get as much done as possible. Um, and should that not be enough, then we will be doing things, I personally, a few of us will be able to work a few, a few hours during the week, and then next weekend we'll be picking up uh, where we left off. So um, Monique, uh, Councillor Manna usually posts on uh, her website hours and different details about that, you certainly can give a call to me directly or send me an email. Um, if you want information, if you know you can come down and you want to give us a heads up, feel free to contact one of us and, and uh, we can write your name down. At least we have a number. We usually like to have some water with us. We generally will buy pizza or something for the workers. We try to make it as easy as possible on you because it's so important to, to get this done and we do appreciate the extra woman, man, and child power. Um, when I say child, I'm talking about children who can help now. We don't need to babysit any, so keep that in mind, all right? And yeah, I have kids, it's a great thing, but we want people who are going to be able to come ready to work, bring your work gloves, um, warm clothing. It's supposed to be very cold this weekend, and we hope that you will join us. All this will be in preparation for tree lighting, which is going to happen again, our, our citizens group tree lighting, which will take place um, on November 30th the Sunday after Thanksgiving, which has, seems to have been the tradition for the last five out of six years. The first year it was a Friday, changed it up to Sunday. That will be, again, we are very lucky to have the space on, at the Southbridge Savings Bank on the corner. And that will take place at 5 o'clock on November 30th when uh, we will watch Santa come down Main Street 
um, and uh, arrive at the tree to light it, do a little Christmas caroling, and then head down to the common, which uh, will have wonderful, uh, will have some great entertainment again, a couple of uh, different um, items this year out there, a uh, little extra singing going on. Uh, we've been very lucky to have the conference center donate cocoa and cookies again. The village photo uh, will be there again to take photos of your yourself, your pets, your young children, um, and that's always a wonderful thing. Santa has been has had us on his schedule for months now, <laughs> and um, and of course that wonderful tree, as you know, um, Marshall Morse and Marshall and Pam Morse and their family participate each year with helping us get that tree, and um, we generally have uh, some wonderful elves who show up on a Saturday. Saturday morning or Sunday morning at 7 a.m. and we get that tree stood up for the town. So these are a lot of great things and everybody always says how wonderful it is, but I always say the same thing, you know, it's nice to get a pat on the back, but it's even better if we get, you give us a hand. Um, so if you can help in any way, shape, or form, we'd love it. If you want to participate even a little bit more on the 30th, um, maybe you want to have some sort of a float. As you know, the last couple of years, we've had a couple of floats. Um, I say that loosely because it kind of depends on what we get done Thanksgiving weekend. If you have a group, an organization that would like to do something and, and prepare, a, uh, whether it's a, a vehicle that's lit up or decorated or whether you have a, a trailer that you want to do something with or I know a number of groups have come, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, the Brownies um, have come and, and pulled little wagons and, and made it festive. The more the merrier. Get in touch with us, though. Let us know so we can prepare and know how many people will participate for safety's sake. We just want to make sure that we know what's happening. So. Uh, we're going to put we're going to put the information on the cable access channel, which, as we mentioned, was like 191, 92, 93, somewhere up in there, 191, 192, 193. If you look at uh, there will be flyers around town. Village Photo has been great and printed up flyers for us, so you'll start seeing those out. Get the message out. May seem early, but it really isn't. Um, it takes a lot of a lot of time and energy to get it done. And a big shout out to Dick Cowett, who is continuing on in Rudy's memory to get these things done. Um, and his sidekick, Mike, who's been great at the workshop as well. So uh, we appreciate their efforts, and we hope to see all of you on the 30th or sooner. Um, get in touch with myself or Councilor Mana. We'd love to have you. Thank you. That's it. Councilor Carrasco. Yes, I have a few things um, this evening. Uh, first, there's an event, um, the Visiting Nurses Association of, the Worcester, of Southern Worcester County formerly Webster Dudley Samaritan Association, is being joined by the Oxford District Nursing and Auburn District Nursing. They will hold an event on Wednesday, November 12, 2014, at the Indian Ranch, Route 16, Webster, Mass. From 5 p.m. to 8 p.m., there will be cocktails and hors d'oeuvres to be served. Um, second, I was um, able to um, be part of today and um, go to the Charlton Street um, School um, Veterans Day program. Um, it, is, it was an awesome time. I just want to commend Mr. Um, Principal Latil and um, his staff and his, um, the children for such a great job that they put on for the veterans. Um, it was well attended once again, and it was awesome to see. Um, truly, their last kickoff song was really moving. It, 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 the way they sang, I am proud to be an American, really, um, if that doesn't move you, I'm not sure what will. We might have to wake you up, but um, it was an awesome time, and I just want to congratulate Charlton Street School for doing such a great job with that program. Also, I just want to um, just remind people, um, sometimes we, we don't think of holidays and we don't um, purpose in our hearts to teach our families and teach those that are around us. Tomorrow is just not a day off. Tomorrow is not a day where people just, you get eight hours paid um, just for working. It's, it's, we are honoring veterans um, as someone that has been blessed um, as a family by veterans and also as someone that has had uh, family members that has been in active combat um, in Iraq and Afghanistan and have seen um, some of the results um, with my personal family. I, I want to um, just make a suggestion to, to, our, to our citizens to take time to educate the little ones, educate those that are around us, because it's just not a day off of school. It's not a day off of work. It's truly to recognize those that have served before us, 
those that will serve after us, and those that are serving currently. And I personally want to say thank you to those that have done that. And um, as far as me and my house, um, your service will not go without notice. And I just want to thank all the veterans that are here tonight and those that have served to our community um, and those across the nation that have done it. Thank you so much um, for, for a price that is not easy, but you do it so well. Thank you. And that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Uh, just briefly to, to build off of that, uh, th that's something that uh, even in my own classroom today, we spend a lot of time talking about Veterans Day and, and why it's important and beyond just being a day off from school uh, or a holiday or anything to that effect. And uh, with that, I just wanted to share a, a quick quote from President Kennedy that I think uh, is relevant for this, and, and that is, as we express our gratitude, we must never forget that the highest appreciation is not to utter words, but to live by them. Uh, so not to just to say, hey, happy Veterans Day, and now I'm going to go and sit back on my couch, but actually do something. Uh, thank a veteran. Um, sincerely thank a veteran and, and do a little something uh, would be great. Moving on to agenda item number 18, discussion of the next meeting date. It will be next week, Monday, November 17, 2014, at 7 p.m. here in Council Chambers. And agenda item number 19 is adjourned. So moved. Second. All in favor? Yes. Thank you. We are adjourned.